There we go. All right. So, and then we have the last one. Uh, what was, what's the name of this guy? Carbon disulfide. Yep, carbon disulfide. This was the stuff last semester that somebody spilled on themselves. They had to rip their pants off um, because it was and run under the shower. They ended up having to go to the hospital. They're fine, but just be aware of that stuff. Don't spill it on yourself. It's extremely volatile. All right. So what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to figure out the intermolecular attraction forces that we have for each of these up front. Now, what's the first thing we need to do to determine these? Lewis structures. Lewis structures. Okay, so let's draw the Lewis structures. Anyone want to draw some Lewis structures? All right, after you finish, you're allowed to give this to anybody to make them do it. I like that. Anyone else? Anyone else have Kyle! A oh, no, Liam! I'm kidding! I'm sorry! <laughs> Damn, I hit you right in the head, too. I'm so sorry, Jenny. I'm really sorry, Jenny. <laughs> Science. Oh man. Yeah, I know there's a reason I teach science and there is a reason I was a swimmer in high school. I can't row. At least it wasn't hard, right? It was, it was probably the most gentle throw you've ever had at your head. Any more surveys? No? No? Good? Okay. We got, uh, we got Jesse's right here. Sorry, Elliot. Jeez. Jesse, are you a commuter? Well, thank you, Elliot. Are you a commuter? Yeah. From where? Uh, Hold on. All right. Oh. How we looking? All right. It's all let everyone know in an email. Okay. Right. Thanks, Elliot. Right. All right. So we we can't actually do one for D, so don't worry about D. We'll all do that one, unless you want to do it. What are you thinking, Kyle? Down that way. Always being fancy. Wait, B still needs to be done. So does I. I was waiting for you to flinch as you walk by. Don't hit me! <laughs> Man, I feel bad. I really tried to get it to you, Kyle. It was just. Alright, that looks perfect. She didn't suffer any brain trauma. That's good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I know now there's recorded evidence of me abusing one of my students. Great. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. That'll that'll do. That'll do, baby. That'll do. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, are any of these incorrect? Any of them? No. You guys did good. Good job. All right, now, now what we have to do, we have to go through and we have to assess um, what intermol, we have to figure out if the compound is polar, nonpolar, ionic, covalent, all that sort of stuff. So the very first one, ionic or covalent? Oh no, he's already got it all up there. Except for, the except for I didn't put dipole, dipole. Yep, I got dipole, dipole, so we'll toss it on there. Dipole, dipole. <laughs> so, ammonia has all the above. Dispersion, hydrogen bonds, and dipole, dipole. Why does this guy qualify to have H bonds? Because there's an H and an N bond. Why would you say? Because he's special. Because he's special. Yeah, he is a type of special. All right, um, the next one, ionic or covalent? Covalent. Yep, covalent. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. Polar. Overall dipole moment pointing in that direction, right? Okay, since it's polar, what intermolecular attraction forces do we have? Dispersion, good, go with the easy one. There's always dispersion in all of these. All right, what's the other force? It's polar. Yep, dipole, dipole. Okay, um, we have carbon, or excuse me, chlorine trifluoride. What is the molecular shape of this compound? T -shaped. T -shaped. Yep, it's a T-shaped. Is it polar or nonpolar? It's polar. Um, it's drawn a little goofy here. That's okay. Um, I would have drawn it more like that. That's because I'm a symmetry nerd. Everywhere. Yep. <laughs> Judging your art. Um, 
And due to symmetry, this dipole. So these two dipoles will cancel each other out, but that one doesn't cancel. So it's a polar compound. All right, if it's polar, what type of intermolecular attraction forces do we have? Yep, dipole, dipole. Dispersion. Okay, in this one, in D, we have sodium chloride dissolved in water. Is it ionic or covalent? You sure? Yes. It's ionic and it's covalent. What? Because there's not only sodium chloride in here, we also have water in there. All right. So, what type of interactions do we have in this case? All the above. Name them. So, dispersion. Give me another one. Dipole, dipole. Yep, dipole, dipole. Give me another one. Ion dipole. Ion dipole. There we go. All right, give me one more. H bonds. Okay, now my question is, is which of those is the strongest? The ion dipole. Ion dipole. Which one is the weakest? Dispersion. Dispersion. Good, you're learning. All right. I love learning. Learning is great. All right, now the, the sulfur trioxide, polar or nonpolar? Yep, it's nonpolar. Does everyone see why? Or do you want me to draw dipoles? We're good. Okay, we're good. Um, so if it's nonpolar, what is the only intermolecular attraction force it can have? Yep, dispersion. Dispersion. Okay, and the very last one, is it polar or nonpolar? It's nonpolar, so what type of intermolecular attraction force? Dispersion. Awesome. All right. Now we have the other... Um, daily problem. We're, what we were doing was we were looking at a series of compounds. What were those compounds? Do you remember? F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. Yep, so we had F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and we had to figure out which one of these is going to have the highest boiling point and which one's going to have the lowest boiling point, and we had to rank them. Now let's draw the Lewis structures for these. We do that, there's just a single bond between each of these. Okay, BR, BR, the exact same thing. So we're at a point where actually the Lewis structure is not going to help us out at all. Because if you look at all of these compounds, are they ionic or are they covalent? Covalent. They're covalent. Are they polar or are they nonpolar? Polar. Nonpolar. They're nonpolar. That's okay. So they're all they're all covalent. They're all nonpolar. So now we have to think what is going to result in the greatest amount of intermolecular attraction forces, or what What intermolecular attraction forces do these guys all have? Dispersion. They all have dispersion, right? Okay. So they all have dispersion. Now the problem becomes, which one has the most dispersion forces with it? Go for it. The one with the most electrons. Okay, so which one has the most electrons? Iodine. They all have the same number of valence electrons, but iodine, each iodine has, I think, 53. Yeah, I'm good. All right, 53 electrons in them. Yeah, Jesse. Would it be wrong to say the more electronegative it is? The... Yep, because actually electronegativity goes in the exact opposite trend. Because fluorine is the most electronegative element, and then if you're looking at the halogens, Fluorine would be the most electronegative, followed by chlorine, followed by bromine, followed by iodine. Actually, a weird thing is, is iodine and carbon have almost the same electronegativity. So now we have to figure out which one. We said the ones that have the most electrons and it have the most dispersion forces. So um, if we were talking about dispersion, the strongest, which one's going to have the strongest dispersion forces? I2. Okay. And then the weakest? What's that going to be? Yep, F2. Okay, so now 
we're talking about the boiling point. And what the boiling point is, is you can think about it as a way is the amount of energy we need to go from kind of a more condensed liquid to free gas phase molecules and raving. It's awesome. All right. Um, so it's the energy we need to pull those guys apart. So we have to look at which ones have the strongest interactions and which ones have the weakest. So let's talk about the boiling point then. Boiling point. Okay. So which one is going to have the highest? F2. And we're going to have the lowest. All right. How many people say F2? Raise your hand. As what? As the highest. You have one brave soul, two brave souls. Any others? Any takers? How many people say I2? Yes. Matt, why I2? Watch your mouth. <coughs> Sorry. Or no, Noah, you go. You, you do enough food in your mouth. Uh, because it has the strongest intermolecular forces. Yep, it has the strongest forces. So it's harder to pull them apart to get them to go into the gas phase. So the boiling point is going to be the highest for I2, and it's going to be the lowest for which one? F2. 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 Um, so the way that we said the question was worded is, is we want it in decreasing boiling point. So we're starting with the highest, we're going to the lowest. So the way we should do this, I2 followed by what? Br2 followed by Cl2 followed by fluorine. Okay, does everyone see why? All right. So um, last time I drew some really crude drawings of unit cells and we tried to understand what were these uh, unit cells and we talked about Three types of lattices. The lati. Come on, zoom out. We're we'll focused. Um, what were those three lattices or lati? Yeah. Uh, primitive cubic. Yep. Uh, body centered cubic. And yep. And force centered cubic. All right. So we have. <laughs> those three types of lattices, and each of those lattices actually has a different amount of atoms on the inside of them. And unfortunately, you can't really see that too well up there. Um, but let, let's redraw them quickly, just so we have them. All right, so I never put my divider line up, oh man. There we go. Straight as an arrow. All right. Um, so we have our primitive cubic. Cubic. And with that one, we're going to draw our fancy little square. Cube. Cube. That works better. Hence the name cubic. He's technically correct to the best kind. <laughs> all right, and where are the atoms in the primitive cubic? At all the corners. Yep, at all the corners. There we go. All right, then we had um, bodied centered cubic, where again we'll draw our cube. Trying to get some three-dimensional perspective. There we go. And where are the atoms in this case? Every corner. Yep, at every corner, and then there's one at the very center. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one at the very center. And what was the very last one? Face. Yep, face centered face, center cubic. And with that one, we drew a super ugly picture. Draw it out again. <coughs> uh oh, that's a jacked up cube. Yeah, I know. I'd change of perspective. There we go. That looks a bit better. A bit better. Not really cubic. All right, where, where, are the, where are the 
the atoms in this case? At the corners. Yep, at the corners and on the, the center of the faces. Is there one in the middle? There is not one in the middle. It's just on the faces. So one, one on top, one on one of the sides, one on the other side, one on this side, and one on the bottom. It doesn't look too good. Now the question becomes is, how many actual atoms are on the inside of each of these cells? Because part of them are being bisected. For example, it's kind of only a quarter of, or an eighth of each uh, sphere that's contained within this box right now. When we look at this guy, there's one in the very center, but some on the edges. So what we're going to do, we're going to make a little table. We're going to talk about the position in the cell. And we're going to talk about the fraction. We're going to keep track of the fraction of atom in the cell. And we, we can have a couple of different positions. We can have one in the very dead center. We can have one on a face, one on an edge, and one on a corner. So in this case, an edge, this would be considered a corner. An edge would be somewhere in between. That orange dot is a center. And uh, one side is a face. So if we have one at the very center, what fraction of the atom is inside there? All of it, so one. What about on a face? Yep, half. Edge, fourth, and then a corner, yep, an eighth. All right. So we're going to look at an example of this. Because we'll actually be able to, de to determine the density of metals based upon the cubic cell, or whatever cubic cell it is, and the number of atoms on the inside. So example, determine. <coughs> The number of sodium cations and chlorine anions, if NaCl, huh, that worked out pretty well, <laughs> has a face centered cubic lattice. And we're going to try and show the figure, and then if that doesn't work out too well, we're going to have to draw it. Now, we might still take an attempt at drawing it anyways. There we go. Oh, man, that's kind of crazy. If you keep looking here, <laughs> it just keeps going for infinity. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa, dude. Yeah. All right. Um, so, that's eh, not working out well. Let's try moving it down here. There we go. That's a bit better. Um, so, this is kind of a, a representation of that cell. This gives you a three-dimensional representation, which is kind of hard to see. But then we can look at it um, with kind of a, a cutout picture, a little cartoon schematic, and we can we can see that a little bit better. All right. So first. Uh, let's concentrate um, on the on the sodiums, and then we'll move to the chlorines. All right, so let's check out the sodiums. Um, we have in this case these are our sodiums, so. How many corners do we have in total? Four. How many? We have eight. Yep, you should have eight, eight corners. Okay. We can convert these directly to atoms because we know we're going to need corners down here. 
We're going to have atom up top. How many corners do we need to make one atom? Eight. Yep, we need eight for every one atom. So we get one atom out of that guy. But that's not all that we have. We also have some faces, right? How many faces do we have? Six. Yep, we have six faces. So how many faces do we need per atom? Face for every one atom. We need a half a face. So for every two faces, we get one atom. So how many atoms do we have out of the faces? Out of this part? Three. Yep, three. So how many total atoms of sodium do we have? Four. Four, four Na plus, I guess I should say ions. Be more clear. Because they're charged. All right, now let's look at the chlorines. Um, do, we have, do we have any in the center? Well, do it. No, nope, we don't have any. Oh, wait. Yeah, we don't have any in the center. Um, what about faces? How many faces do we have? Yeah, six faces. Yep, six faces. So we need, oops. For every two faces, we have one atom. Oh, wait a minute. The chlorines are the green guys. I'm lying to you. I'm completely lying to you. Should have yelled at me more. We were all confused. Yeah. Oh, we did. You did chlorine first. Yeah, I did do chlorine first. Oops. So the Easy enough. Easy enough for you to change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There we go. My bad. Yeah, you should cross that out. Yeah, I'll also, I'll, I'll initial in there. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody take a picture quick. There we go. There we go. All right, we're good. I know, I, I know it's very rare, but I made an error. It's your 12. <laughs> All right, so let, let's look at let's look at sodium plus then. So, um, how many edges do we have for sodium? The gray one. How many? We should have twelve edges. Twelve edges. And okay, yeah. Where do you get the edges from? Like you tell where you count. So right along here, right? Yes. So we have one, two. Three that's hidden, four. Then we have one, two, three, four, another one that's hidden. And we have one, two, three, four up here. We have three sets of those, so that makes a total of 12. Okay, do you see it? Okay? Maybe? Yes? No? Okay. So let's let's draw only the what is it the sodium or the yeah the sodiums in this case. Welcome back. Oh, it's gonna be Tuesday at six o'clock. All right, that was easy enough. What? Tuesday, Tuesday is at six. Be there or be square. I'm supposed to draw a cube for you. No, I like my cubes. What the hell? All right, so we're gonna we're gonna ignore the. Um, <coughs> it's a great cube. Don't touch it. We're gonna ignore the chlorines right now, and we're gonna look at just the sodiums. So we have the sodium up top here, one there, one there, and one there. Right. We also have another set down here. One there, one there, one there, one there. Okay, we're good with that. And then we have all the ones around the center. So one here, one here, one here, one here. 
Can everyone see that? Kind of? Despite my horrible cube? It's a great cube. Thank you. Build my confidence. <laughs> Man, isn't that bad? All right. Um, so then we have we have uh, yes. Oh, wow, harsh people. I know. Jeez. No respect. Everyone's a critic. All right. So, um, how many edges do we need to make an atom? Four. four. Yep. Four. All right. So how many how many atoms? Yep. Three. Atoms. However, I forgotten one one chlorine. One's in the very center. That's kind of hidden. Hence, face sodium. face centered cubic. Yes, one sodium. Excuse me. One in the very dead center, which I guess is the dead center of that thing. So we have one center. If we have one center, that just equates to one atom, right? So one center. One atom. So we have four sodium atoms, or sodium ions, in the cell. And we have four chlorine ions in the cell. Now, that'll be the hardest example I make you ever do. For the most part, we're going to focus on body centered and primitive cubic. All right, so let's. Um, let's see an example, a working example of this, so we can try and figure out the density of um, a salt based upon our lattice parameters or the lengths of our unit cell. All right, so let's get there. All right. So example, the geometric. <coughs> Arrangements of ions in a crystal whoop, crystal, not crystal, of lithium fluoride is the same as sodium fluoride. The unit cell of lithium fluoride has a lattice parameter just meaning the length of an edge of 4.02 angstroms. That's what that fancy symbol means. Calculate the density in grams per centimeter cubed or lithium fluoride. Now this seems like an impossible task right now, but it isn't. You'll be you should be able to do it. It will be complicated, but we'll get there. Okay, um, what's density equal to? Yeah, mass over volume. We have to figure out our mass, and we can we can figure out our volume. Which do you want to do first? Mass. Okay, the mass. This guy has the exact same unit cell as this one, right? How many lithium atoms are in there? Four. Four lithium atoms. Okay, so four Li atoms. Okay. How many fluorine atoms do we have? Four. Four fluorine atoms. I'm going to remove this. Okay. Um, what is the atomic weight of one lithium atom? Yep, AMU for every one atom, right? And we have our fluorine. We're going to multiply this by a ratio. What unit has to go on the denominator? 
Yep, it got to be atom. And we're going to try and convert to a mass, AMU. For every one atom of fluorine, how many AMU is that? 18.99. Yep. 18.998. Where do you get those numbers from? I'm getting them directly off the periodic table. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Those. Yep, those. Remember, that could be grams per mole or it could be AMU per atom. They're interchangeable. When we add all of that up, what we get is 103.756 AMU. Okay. Now, we have a mass, let's get to a volume. Have you erased this? Garbage. It's garbage. You know, I'm a garbage. I don't know what cabbage is. All right, uh, now let's figure out the volume. Uh, what's the, how do you figure out the volume of a cube? Yep, length times width times height. Length times width times height. In this case, it's just going to be the same parameter cubed, right? So we have 4.02 angstroms times 4.02 angstroms times 4.02 angstroms, or you could cube it. The lattice parameter is one edge. One edge. Yep, the lattice parameter is just one edge. So if we go to, and we're drawing that out. Here we go. We're going to get a cube this time. Are we? No. Oh, okay. We got a rectangular prism. We tried. Okay, would you like a, I can show you how to actually draw You've got to make them all parallel. I like the, my cubes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the last one. Why is it boring? It looks like the last one. All right. Is that a cube? No. <laughs> we have 4.02 angstroms no, on that, that size. Right. We don't have to be. You have to be <laughs> I can't. I can't draw straight. What they are. And then we're forgetting that last parameter in there. All right. So the length you can see for each one of them, it's 4.02. So if we want to get that volume, we just have to square this value. If we do that. What are my units going to be? Cubed. Angstrom's cubed. All right, so I'm going to get angstrom's cubed. And then looking at the math, we get 64.968. Okay, so now we have, let me erase this guy. We have density as equal to mass divided by volume. So we can plug in our mass. We have 103.9. 756 AMU. And then at the bottom we have 64.968 angstroms cubed. However, these aren't the units we desire, right? No. No, what are we, we're trying to get to what? Grams. Grams. Okay, so let's focus on trying to get grams first. What unit has to go on the denominator? AMU. AMU. Okay, what's going to go up top? Grams. Yep, for every one gram, you have 6.02 <coughs> times 10 to the 23rd AMU. So up top, we're going to get grams. We'll try, we'll try that again. 02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, does anybody know how to convert angstroms to centimeters? I've never heard of an angstrom. Okay, there we go. I don't know. I don't know that conversion, but I do know how to go from angstroms to meters. Does anybody know how many angstroms are in a meter? Fifteen. Eight. Ten to the One to one. Ten. One to one. Seven. Ten. Yeah, ten. So. Um, for every one meter, there are 10 to the 10 angstroms. So one meter, there are 10 to the 10 
angstroms. However, if we do that, oh, I need to flip it. Thank you. Oh, you're right, you're done here. Come on, See, that's why you wait till he's completely done. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but you almost did it again. <laughs> ten million ten up here. There we go. Why do we need to make sure that angstroms is up top? Yeah, because these will cancel out. Now, what's going to happen? This will cancel out. One of those will cancel, so we'll get a two, right? Times a meter. Eventually, we'll worry about that in a second. So, how many more times do we have to do that? Twice. Yep, we have to do it two more times. One meter, ten to the ten angstrom, same thing. One meter, ten to the ten angstroms. So, when we do that, um, what I get as a result is two point six five three times 10 to the 6th, what are my units going to be? Grams per meter cubed. Grams per meter squared. Cubed. Cubed. Thank you. I don't know why. You said squared, so I just gave in. Yeah, I know. I wrote three. The mind and body are two very separate things. But don't we want it in centimeters? All right. But we want it in centimeters cubed, right? So what do we got to do? What's going to go up top? Meters. Let's convert to centimeters. If I have one meter, how many centimeters do I have? Hundred. Yep. Let's do it again. One meter, one hundred centimeters. One meter, one hundred centimeters. Yes. It came from up here. I just evaluated all of that junk. Okay? All right, so now when I do that, what I get as a result is 2.653 grams per centimeter cubed. That's just what I got. Is it? All right, so now my question is, is one, is that reasonable? Yeah, what's the density of water? One. One. Density of uh, the really dense metals, they can get up to about 12 grams per milliliter or 15 grams per milliliter. All right. Or a centimeter cubed. All right. What's incorrect about this answer? Sig figs. How many sig figs should I have? Yep, should be three. 2.65 grams per centimeter All right, everyone, funky dory. Close enough. Close enough. All right, that works. All right, now let's talk about bonding in metals, because this will be the only time you get to talk about it, and I think it's pretty cool. And I think most of you are already aware of valence and conduction bands, so we'll go through this kind of quick. So let's talk about bonding and metals. Okay, so let's let's draw a little picture. Um, and let's <coughs> let's uh, consider a collection <coughs> what was that? <laughs> of lithium <laughs> Atoms. <laughs> it sounded like a, a dolphin, like, I don't know. It sounded like Mario. <laughs> Mario stepping on a dolphin. That's <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we have, we're going to keep track of the energy, and we're going to have the number of lithium atoms down here. Number of lithium atoms. Okay, so let's look at just, just one lithium atom. If we have one lithium atom, what, and we're only going to consider the valence states, what do we have there? One lithium atom. One valence. Yeah, one valence electron. So we have an energy level like that, right? 
What happens when we have two lithium atoms where they're just s orbitals? Yep, you get two, right? You get a bonding, and you get an anti-bonding combination between the two, right? Bill, we'll put sigma, sigma star. Um, let's go to four lithium atoms. How many bonding orbitals are we going to get, and how many anti-bonding? Yep, two of each. So we're going to get two bonding, two anti-bonding. Jump to eight. How many bonding and how many anti-bonding? So how many bonding orbitals? Yep. We get four. One, two, three, four. They have electrons in them. And then we have the anti-bonding. One, two, three, four. Now let's jump to a really drastic number. Let's jump to infinity. Oh, that's a little bit quickly. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Um, what's going to happen is, is we're going to get a ton of bonding and a ton of anti-bonding states. So. No, they they turned into not lines. They're not. It's not enough. There we go. No, no. All right. Um, and there's going to be a certain point where electrons fill up to. So there's going to be some electrons in here up to a certain point, and then there's just going to be no more electrons. That's a really ugly picture. We can represent this as a bit different. We can represent this as what's called a band, a band, or a continuum of states. So this can be expressed like this. Where these are the occupied states, these are the unoccupied states. So we get a band. Or what's known as is a continuum of electronic states. Continuum of electronic states. All right. Um, and depending on what's known as the band gap, we can get different types of solids. We can get insulators, we can get conductors, and we can get semiconductors. <coughs> so let's talk about those really quickly. All right. So the larger the band gap, where what that is is the difference between the occupied and unoccupied states. Difference between occupied and unoccupied states. increases the more insulating the system. And what do I mean by insulating? Yeah, less conductive. I'm talking about electricity right now. Um, so these typically fall into three categories. We have this guy. We have this guy. And we'll have that one. All right. Which one of these is the most conductive? The first one. The very first one. What type of um, element is this, would you say? Copper. Yeah, copper would work. So it's a? 
Yep, it's a metal. These guys are metals. So, and with metals, there is no band gap. And they're conductors. What about the one all the way on the, the right? Yep, it's a non-metal. Or, in this case, we call those an insulator. And for that one, there's a large band gap. And these are non-conductors. Or, excuse me, insulators. <laughs> right, seems kind of counterintuitive, or all kind of, uh, what is it, repetitive. What about the center guy? Silicon. silicon. So what is silicon? Yeah, well, it is a metalloid, but it's known as a semiconductor. And for that one, there's an intermediate band gap, or a small band gap. All right, so that's all I have for you today. We've got to get through some other junk pretty quickly next week. Um, are there any questions about what we've talked about so far? No? Maybe everything? Okay. If you're having trouble seeing three-dimensional representations of these crystal structures, there are plenty of resources online to find these. Search for something called Fable. All right. <laughs> Megan, could you hit the button and turn that off? And let, all right, show me, show me how to draw. Teach me. Okay, so one, one square.